Welcome to the DNX Podcast, the number one resource for entrepreneurs, nomads, and impact-driven souls. And I am your coach, Sylvia Christman. Welcome back, everyone. I'm here today with my friend, Kat Cole, who is the president and COO of a billion-dollar global franchise company that has stores in over 61 countries. She's also a humanitarian and in West Bester. So thank you so much for making the time. I know that you have a very, very busy day and I appreciate you being here. Welcome. Thanks for having me. So we briefly chatted before this and there were a couple of things that really stood out and always have stood out about you for me, that you bring an authenticity to the world and the way that you work. Do you want to start us off to tell us a little bit more about what about your career path and your level of authenticity have really um, manifested into the life that you have built today? Sure. You know, I think the, the part that stands out to me and the feedback that I get on the authentic style of leadership is first being incredibly open um, about my background. So I grew up um, the child of a single parent. We left my father when I was nine years old. My father was an alcoholic. And for many years, I helped raise my sisters. And we were incredibly poor. Um, for several years after leaving my father, my mom fed us on a food budget of um, $10 a week, which is more uh, close to what people fed their families on in the 1930s. And uh, it's amazing what she did. And the example of leadership and resilience uh, that I witnessed as I grew up seeing her as a role model. And I started working when I was very young in restaurants, in Hooters restaurants specifically, and um, dropped out of college. I was the first person in my family to get into college, but dropped out when I was 20 because I had the opportunity to start opening franchise restaurants around the world at the age of 19. I went to Australia, South and Central America, Asia, uh, and other parts of of North America. Uh, and, and that was when I was 19 and 20. And it taught me so many lessons in addition to my childhood about um, bridging cultures, learning, listening, communicating, and building trust. And every time I opened a new franchise in a new country on a new continent, I had a different team. And I often challenge people to think about do, do your job tomorrow with a different team and then do your same job the next month with a different team again. And it's, it's a brutal thing to do. And it's very difficult because you are constantly working to get to know each other while you're trying to do the work. Uh, and that process of leading with a different team in a different culture every few months formed my appreciation for the need to bring your true self to work, to the, to the work, to the job, to the team, as often as you can, because the thing that builds trust the fastest is an awareness of empathy. And so I would come in, meet the new team, and tell my story first, be open about my childhood, my background, my struggles, and my learning. Uh, and even though I was the youngest person in the room and always leading a team around the world that was older than I was at the time, being open and honest about my background and allowing my personality to shine through instead of trying to be someone I wasn't allowed me to be trusted. And trust is the foundation of great uh, business and working relationships, no matter where you are around the world. And empathy and vulnerability are the precursors to building trust when you don't otherwise have a relationship. And so that formed my appreciation for being my true self. And I will also say the mistakes I made in those early years growing up, growing franchises around the world were almost always when I was trying to be a little bit of someone that I wasn't. I was trying to make up for the fact that I was young by being overly formal or overly directive or overly professional. And while it was helpful in some senses, it was... Um, it was disconnected from my casual and approachable nature and people could sense that I was trying too hard and it would, I would eventually come to learn that. And so authenticity for me is not only the path to trust, which accelerates business results and the ability to manage and work with teams, but it is also about the simple fact that if I am trying to be someone different than who I am, that takes energy. 
And I believe in energy management more than time management. And if my energy is being drained by my efforts to be a different version of myself, then that's less energy that's going into the work. My brain doesn't have uh, unlimited capacity. So for me, authenticity is as much about building trust as it is to managing my energy and making sure I can put all my energy into the work because I'm not using any of my energy to try to be someone I'm not. Uh, I would also say, though, when I give that advice, some people say, oh, so that means you're a, uh, you just tell people, take me as I am, and you don't ever change. And that is not the case. I do believe that to respect cultures and environments, whether it's a different country or a different company or a new customer, sometimes we have to turn our styles up in volume a bit and sometimes down in volume a bit. And there is a difference between being authentic to who you are but then turning it up or down to be respectful of a culture. There's a difference between that and being someone you're not. Um, And there's a little bit of gray area in there, but I've learned that as well. So if somebody wants to learn how to be more authentic, um, because it does take courage to actually allow yourself to be seen. Yes. Is there something you would recommend they do? Or is there something they can do to start carefully? (laughs) Yeah, I think the first... Um, small step, which for some uh, would feel like a big step. The first small step is finding an environment where you are comfortable sharing something personal about yourself. It doesn't have to be oversharing. You know, you don't need to go into the darkest part of your past, um, but something that's personal. And in particular, a personal struggle. One of my favorite ways to network actually at an event um, is instead of passing business cards or trying to break into a group conversation is when I'm next to one person. I'll introduce myself and we'll have a bit of small talk and then I will ask, what's one challenge you're dealing with right now? I'm not asking for their history with their therapist. I'm just asking about a challenge they're dealing with right now. And then I will share the same, or sometimes I will share it, you know, to begin with. And I think either sharing something personal or sharing a current challenge is a small step in the direction of humanizing who you are and reminding either the one person you're talking to or the small group or the large group, if you want to jump into that ocean, (laughs) um, reminding them that we are more alike than we are different is a way to take a step in the direction of authenticity. And authenticity is not only revealing your challenges in your past, but it is one piece because it can create the bridge of empathy. So that's, I think that's a good first step. That is such an incredible idea. I'm going to, I'm going to start trying that. Here's a question though. What do you do when people launch into uh, giving unsolicited advice when somebody shares their challenge. Mm. How do you navigate that? So um, I, I'll give a few answers because it really does depend on where, where you are at this stage in your life and in that moment. If you're in a place of strength and courage, even though the advice is unsolicited, you may just say, thank you so much for sharing that with me. Right? It's sort of a nice period on the sentence they offered that you did not ask for. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So thank you for sharing that with me so much because someone is obviously trying to help and realizing that is important. And if you're in a place of strength, but you don't want to double click on their unsolicited advice, then thank you so much for sharing that with me. I really appreciate that. Um, If you actually respect the person and you'd like to know their ideas or opinions, but the unsolicited advice they gave is in a different direction and you need to redirect, but you actually want some help, then you can say, thank you. What would really be helpful for me is to know if you have an experience in X. And, And so you're redirecting them to something that is that you're actually interested in. And instead of asking them for advice, you're asking about their experience because you will take your own ideas and lessons out of their experience. And it moves them from a place of advice giving to experience sharing. Um, The third version is if you are offended or frustrated um, by their 
offering of the advice and it's you feel that it's obvious that you're offended or frustrated I think there's still a version of saying you know thank you for offering that Um, I'm just trying to take this one step at a time if you're talking about a challenge that is sometimes people are giving you advice not on a challenge on an opportunity and you need to you feel that you need to shut it down because if you don't they will continue and that's when you say thank you so much for sharing that Um, I'm definitely just focused on X Uh, on this one thing instead of that whole thing, but thank you. And the tone of saying thank you can be a tone of closure or the tone of saying thank you can be one of keeping the door open. And then in the second example, you redirect it to asking for something more specifically that would be more helpful to you. Yeah. So thank you. That is very valuable. I think so many people can relate to this (laughs) that, you know, especially when you're in a place of overwhelm, and yeah. somebody asks you to um, share a current challenge and all of a sudden you have a lot of misguided, well, intended, but misguided advice coming at you. <laughs> you know, I think the other reminder for, um, for those listening is not just to envision when you are in the role of the person who is being given unsolicited advice, um, but when the seats are reversed, And when someone shares a challenge, we should all also remember that it's um, a a very elegant and graceful response to say, you know, um, I've had similar experiences. If it's ever helpful, I'd be open to sharing. And the nice thing about that is you're not putting them on the spot to say, um, would you like to hear my thoughts now? Because that's a little can be a little awkward for some people. You're saying, look, if you are ever interested, just know that I'm here. I have some similar experiences. And that gives them the permission to say, thank you so much and close it off. Or to say, actually, I would love to hear that now if you have a few minutes. So there's also a, um, a graceful reminder to be a, um, a good partner on the other end of the discussion as well. I always think about it as a form of consent. You yes. know, and consent is and getting buy-in from people mm-hmm. because, and that can be a moment to moment situation. You know, mm-hmm. I can consent to a piece of feedback <laughs> and if I want to, and, and so I, and I say that because professionally I sit on the, the advice giving end, right? <laughs> so uh, I have to remind myself every time that it's a, a step-by-step process that if they consented into the first part of it, I need to re- I need to ask for consent every step along the way because we get into overwhelm at some point. Excellent point. Yeah. So how do you get buy-in from people individually or even a team? Uh, You know, I think part of it is doing my part. Um, I always have to be sensitive to, even if I'm working incredibly hard or if I have um, what I believe is implied credibility especially from traveling around the world, having teams in different places around the world, I've learned I cannot and should not assume that those on the team see my day-to-day efforts and know my full level of credibility. And that is particularly true when it's a new team often. And so there has to be, for me, there has to be a, a huge layer of humility that is constantly reminding myself that I am earning my relationship every day with the team. And over time, if the team is the same for many months, many years, then maybe that is slightly less true. Um, But the world is changing around us. And so I like the, I'm earning my relationship every day mentality. It helps me not get lazy as a leader and the team can feel it. They can feel that I'm um, appreciating that um, my advice and direction is not always a given um, to assume. So that humility is incredibly important. And it comes through by asking, I might have a strong opinion with the team or an idea and I'll pause and, and give the space to ask, what do each of you think? What am I not seeing? And it gives them, to your point, it's a bit of offered consent um, that allows people the, the space and the freedom because it is requested. And it's not just, do you agree, right? That's a wrong, that's a different way to ask the question. Do you agree? They might um, politely shake their heads. 
but asking a different question, which is what am I not seeing? What am I missing? Um, who might be someone else that could enhance this thinking? Those are different types of facilitating questions that help get the most out of the team and, of course, contribute to increasing their participation and engagement and meaningfulness and buy-in. So humility is one. On the other side, however, um, courage. So sometimes the thing that the teams need to see is the ability to take a stand and make a decision and move on. Uh, And I find that teams, especially teams around the world that are dealing with very different dynamics in their markets, get incredibly frustrated with an indecisive leader. And I have learned that sometimes uh, what is called for is making a clear decision, even if I acknowledge what I might be missing. But I'll say something like, I would be failing you if I didn't make this decision and allow us to move on even though I understand it doesn't solve for all of our issues. So for the people who disagree with the decision, it acknowledges that it's not solving for all the issues. But for those who want to just move on and get a decision and get to work, it solves for that. So there's this balance of humility and curiosity on one side um, that bridges buy-in and keeps engagement open, but then courage and confidence on the other side. So they see, okay, I, I I trust you. I believe in you. I want to follow you. You're not making brash, um, uninformed decisions. And even when we have to make a decision, you're acknowledging it might not be perfect, but there's a reason to make a decision and move on. Those seem to be the things that increase buy-in for me. So when you build up courage to let yourself be seen What do you think needs to happen to um, to learn and also understand what is actually appropriate to share and what Mm -hmm. is not appropriate to share? Yeah. And and how do you really um, differentiate that? It's a great question. You know, the first, I think there are two rules that are sort of true for a lot of questions like that, um, but particularly relevant for this one. And the answer is know thyself and know thy audience. (laughs) Um, I know me. And I know that I am naturally comfortable with sharing my background. It does not take great emotional effort. Um, Therefore, I don't get really emotionally worked up when I share my past. I know that about myself. I know it's not going to throw me off course when I talk about my past. So that is the first set of questions you would answer is how does um, sharing whatever it is I'm considering sharing, how is it first going to affect me? And it doesn't mean that if it brings forward emotion, you shouldn't share it. It's just understanding that range. If it brings a tear to your eye, that's okay. Um, If it's going to cause you to be rocking in a corner, sobbing uncontrollably, probably not okay. Um, But then I would say the second part of the question matters, which is know thy audience. There are groups, um, peers, or groups that I connect with where the purpose is to unlock and unleash the deepest emotions, the highest highs and the lowest lows. And I know that about that audience. And if I don't allow myself to go there, the group will see that I am not contributing in the way that they are, um, that we are really there to go deep. But if I'm in my office setting and with my team, if I know that there are things I could share that aren't going to throw me off, but are that are authentic pieces to share that demonstrate openness and vulnerability. And I know that the team is of a certain style or personality or culture. Those are my, those are my, um, that's my framework. There's freedom within that framework. What am I comfortable with and what will be reasonably palatable? And there's a little bit of guesswork in there, but as you get to know your team, it's less guesswork and more, informed by what you really do know about people. Um, I also find that having one-on-one conversations with individuals helps build up the awareness of what might be a slightly appropriate in a group and build up the courage. Uh, so, but I get asked that a lot, you know, what is oversharing? <laughs> yeah. So it's first know how it's going to affect you. If you're in a group that's totally cool with hearing um, some emotional story, but you can't handle sharing it, then that's oversharing. 
Um, if you're in a group where you are comfortable sharing, but they are going to feel as if it is the weirdest, most awkward story, then that is oversharing. But if there is a way to bridge it to a relevant topic. So I talk about if we're dealing with um, our franchisees and we're in a business meeting and one of my, um, one of my employees says, one of my leaders says, you know, the franchisees are just saying they can't get this done. It's too hard then I might say, you know what, if my mom can leave our alcoholic father and raise three girls on her own, I think they can do this simple task. It's an example of using a very personal anecdote in a super professional way. And it actually makes things human and lighthearted. Mm -hmm. So that um, hopefully that's helpful to those who are listening and wondering what's appropriate to overshare. But if it's going to make anyone sob uncontrollably, you or the audience, unless it's an environment where that is wanted, that's probably your first um, tell that it's a little too much. <laughs> yes, I would say so. So what happens if, if you do overshare and it creates awkwardness and becomes this huge shame trigger? Mm. Um, so one, remember that often the shame we feel is placed more on ourselves by us than by others. And so I would give, I would encourage listeners to give yourself permission to change just because you've overshared or done something that feels a bit embarrassing. And this is beyond sharing. This is just maybe, maybe you had a moment where you spoke in a way you're not proud of, or um, you behaved in a way that is not something that is your best. Um, so this is, I'll broaden it to even more than oversharing. Then give yourself permission to change. Very simply acknowledge it with the person or the group. Hey, I went a little far in that moment. Um, I'm better than that. And I want to thank you for being a calm listener. Um, and I don't know that I don't think that's appropriate and uh, just had a moment of weakness. And then move on, right? You acknowledge it and you move on. If it becomes a pattern, then you need help. Um, <laughs> okay. But if it really is an outlier and you think, yeah. oh God, I'm so embarrassed. The way to increase shame is to swim in the sea of it. And if you allow yourself to swim in the sea of shame, you will only become more ashamed. But if you acknowledge, I just stepped in this puddle, right? It was a sh shameful puddle. I stepped in it and I am now out. And the people who are a part of that moment, they will eventually be out of it too, but they won't come out of it if I keep reminding them of it. Um, through my behaviors or with apologies that go on and on and on. One apology, one acknowledgement, appreciate them being bystanders um, and move on. And the more you do that, the more you recognize that that's the right thing to do and the more courage you'll have to do that. That is something very interesting you said is eventually they will get out of that too, mm -hmm. which may not happen at the same time as you yep. take responsibility for it. Yeah. And it won't, here's an interesting uh, add on. It won't happen until you clear the air, right? So you've, it takes them, a, it might take some people a little longer. There might be a few people I've had these scenarios where some, an employee will have a, you know, an outburst or they'll react to someone inappropriately, maybe knowingly or unknowingly. And to the other person, it wasn't that big of a deal you know, they make a bigger deal of, about it. Like, look, you clearly need to go make peace with this. So um, I don't think it's as big of a deal as you think it is, but go tell that person it bothers you how this went down and you just want them to know that and move on. Um, sometimes it's a bigger deal than the person realizes. Sometimes I have to say, look, I don't know that you realize how you came across. Um, and you, one, you need to know that that's not acceptable here. And two, you need to go clear the air um, because people need to know that you are aware. And, and so others will forgive and eventually forget, um, but only when you clear the air. And then if you clear the air and they say, oh, it wasn't that big of a deal, then that's cool too. And then you have even more comfort that you can move on. Fantastic. I just really love listening to you. Thank you so much. We're already at the end of our time, but this was so insightful and I know that the audiences will love listening to this podcast. Thank you so much for making the time. We appreciate it. Oh, so appreciate it.
That's it for today. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you for your ongoing support. Before I leave you, I want to invite you into my world. Please go check out dnxcommunity.com. This is where you'll find the other nomads and evaders of convention. We'll see you there. And if you're interested in our English speaking events, go and check out dnxglobal.com. You'll find the link below this podcast as well and if you have time one last favor please go to itunes look for sylvia christman or look for the dnx podcast and leave a review thank you so much lovely people and i'll talk to you next time